Hi, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the material from uh, July 18th. Um, so first of all, um, we talked about um, uh, these issues. Uh, actually, this is one of the last things we talked about. But, um, uh, but um, thinking about different possible ways that inheritance could work. And um, we have three models that we have to consider. In our first model, there's one set of genes that might give you, in the case of Tourette's versus OCD, um, our first possibility is you have one set of genes that put you at risk of Tourette's, and then if you get Tourette's, then that secondarily increases your risk of OCD. Um, or you could just get OCD directly through a different set of genes. That's model, that's model A. Model B is the reverse. So one set of genes puts you at risk for OCD. Um, and then once you have OCD, that increases the risk of Tourette's. Or there's a second set of genes that might just give you a direct risk of Tourette's. The third model is that there's a single common set of genes, and that common set of genes increases simultaneously your risk of OCD and your risk of Tourette's, and maybe getting both at the same time. Um, in order to figure out which of these is going on, um, what you need to have is a study where you have probands that have one disease but not the other. So if we um, look back at the, um, the slides that we were looking at with this, um, or the one slide from that one study, um, the relevant probands, the relevant um, data set to consider here is our situation where we have our probands with Tourette's but not OCD. We could have done OCD but not Tourette's, um, but in this case they did Tourette's without OCD. So our probands with Tourette's plus OCD is completely useless for answering this question because in this case, these probands could have, they could have one set of genes that put them at risk for both, or they could have one set of genes that put them at risk for Tourette's and another that put them at risk for OCD that are two separate sets. And this is just, then they could have been, the probands could be unlucky and landed with, with either disease. And then having relatives that have one or the other or both kind of is useless and is, is not surprising and doesn't distinguish between things. Um, that's actually on the homework um, but the interesting probands are the ones that have one disease but not the other. Tourette's without OCD in this case. Um, and then, unsurprisingly, they have an their siblings have an increased risk of Tourette's. The adoptive siblings don't because it's a genetic risk factor. Um, chronic motor tic disorder, also increased risk because that's very similar to Tourette's. But then the interesting thing is that we see siblings with OCD but not Tourette's. In this small study, they actually didn't see any siblings with both, but in a larger scale study, we would expect to see a few siblings with both. So that's why that row is missing there. Um, and so um, in our first model, that one set of genes gives you a risk of Tourette's and then, a se and then secondary risk to OCD, or you can get OCD um, se separately. In that case, with our Tourette's probands, we would expect some siblings with just Tourette's and some siblings with both, but no increased risk of OCD in the siblings. Um, by contrast, in our second model, um, we would expect, um, again, as always, an increased risk of Tourette's syndrome um, uh, and no increased risk of OCD and no increased risk of both. Um, because the, the, in this case, the Tourette's probands must have gotten it from that other gene set that doesn't have any relationship to OCD. Um, and then um, the only case where we see probands with one disease and relatives with just the, probands with just disease A and relatives with just disease B is when there is uh, our third model. There's a single common set of genetic risk factors that can manifest as either uh, Tourette's or OCD. And so that was summarized as well um, in, um, uh, in this section here where we were looking at comorbidities and possible genetic links. The other thing that we talked about is um, dopamine receptors and dopamine receptor antagonists. And this is, again, a quite challenging concept because you just have to, what it really requires is you just have to think very systematically. So first of all, the indirect projecting neurons suppress movement urges. Then dopamine suppresses those neurons, which then will increase movement urges. 
if you have a dopamine D2 receptor agonist that acts like dopamine, it suppresses those neurons, which increases urges to move. A D2 blocker or a D2 antagonist will block the D2 receptors, means no inhibition of the indirect protecting cells. So those indirect protecting cells are firing more action potentials, which means that you do suppress movement. So the D2 blocker ultimately suppresses movement. Um, the D2 blocker also can cause decreased feelings of pleasure because of dopamine's role in the nucleus accumbens and, diff and cognitive impairments because of its role in the frontal cortex that we started talking about with ADHD. Um, but these, um, and so D2 antagonists are, in a sense, hitting the right target for Tourette's syndrome. It just so happens that they also hit other targets. And there's a risk that too much D2 blockade can lead to um, too much of an interference in dopamine signaling. It's something called drug-induced Parkinsonism, which could happen with Tourette's syndrome, can also happen with um, uh, uh, D2 receptor blockers when they're used, and they're sort of traditional antipsychotic, which is the thing that they're marketed as, or the thing that they're sort of often referred to as, because they do also, as we'll talk about schizophrenia later on, um, uh, suppress some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Just a second. Um, we also talked about um, the three types of norepinephrine receptors and norepinephrine alpha-2 receptors, which in general calm, at, when they're turned on, calm activity and can allow, um, can be a, a less direct but more side-effect-free way to manage Tourette's syndrome.